God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Welcome to Kids Corner. I'm so glad you joined us today. We're going to have another exciting story from my favorite book and yours, the Bible. Do you know, in our story today, God is going to show us what we look like on the inside when He sees our sin. What do you think that's going to look like? Well, He's going to tell us. But first, Eddie, he wants to say something to you. Eddie, how are you today? Well, I'm not very good. You know, there are some people I would like to tell them about Jesus. But I'm thinking, me? I'm a nobody. I'm just, I'm just little. I'm small. They, they wouldn't listen to me. Why would they listen to you? They'd say, hey, you're a nobody. You're small. You're little. Well, Eddie, I'm so glad you came today because in our story today, there was someone just like you. Just like me? Whoa. Were they smart, good-looking, intelligent? No, Eddie, they, they, they weren't that. Now, they might have been, but, but they were small. They were little. They were young. Oh. Oh, you mean like that? Well, oh, okay. Yes, Eddie, and this was a little girl. And she told someone about the Lord. Well, did they listen? I bet they didn't listen. I bet they said, what do you know? You're, you're too little. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, Eddie, that's not what they said. So I think you just better stay and listen because it would encourage you to tell others about the Lord. Oh, well, I'm glad I'm here. I'm going to stay. Hey, kids, I'm, I'm going to stay with you today. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. All right, I got to go. Listen to the story. Bye. Bye, everybody. Mwah. Love you. Bye. Now, if I were to ask you, which verse in the Bible do you think that more people know than any other? What would you say? You know, there's a lot of wonderful, wonderful verses in the Bible, but there's one that more people know than any other. And did you guess? It is found in John 3.16. And it says, for God. Now, when we talk about God, what God are we talking about? Do you know, the Bible says that when they would talk to people that didn't know about the one true and living God, they would always say, it is God the Creator. He's the one that made the heavens and the earth and everything in it. And He made you, too. And you know, the Bible says that He made all of creation for man. And it says, for God, this God that made heaven and earth. Now, it also, this verse tells us how he felt about you. The Bible says that for God so loved. You know what? I can say I'm happy. But if I say I'm so happy, that means I'm really happy. And it says God so loved. Now, who do you think this God loved? Well, you know, the Bible says that God so loved the world. He made the world. He made the universe. Now, when it says he so loved the world, what do you think he's talking about? You know, of course, he loved the animals, and he loved the plants, and he loves everything that he created. But there's one special thing that he loves the very most. So when it says, for God so loved the world, he loved the people in the world. It was you and me. That's who he loves. He loves us. And the Bible says that he, God, so, for God, so loved the world that he did something. Do you know God was ruling and reigning in heaven? 
He was keeping the universe in order. And the Bible says that he left heaven and he came down to this earth. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <gasps> Who was his only begotten son? Did you guess Jesus? That's right. He gave his only son. Now, do you know what? I give my time to do this show, and I study, and I come, and I prepare, and I make things that make it interesting. So I give my time. But you know what Jesus gave? Jesus came down to this earth, and the Bible says that he gave more than just his time. He didn't just come down here to say, oh, so how are you doing? Oh, I'm glad you're fine. Oh, let me just have a little conversation with you. No, he came down to this earth and the Bible says that he so loved us that he gave his life. He died on the cross. He says, your sin deserves punishment. I will take your sin and I will die in your place. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Now, the Bible says that whoever believes in him. Now, when you're born, are you born a child of God? The Bible says, no, we aren't. That when we're born into this world, our father is really the devil. Now, of course, we have an earthly father, but it says, no, we're not born into this world as children of God. But the Bible says that whoever believes in him, they're the ones that become children of God. And you know, kids, it's not hard. But what you do have to do is you have to turn from your sin. You have to say, I'm not going to go my own way anymore. I'm going to go God's way. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died to pay the punishment for our sins. I want my sins forgiven. And so it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. We, we shall not live forever apart from God. God says, you won't perish. There is a place of punishment apart from me, but no, no, I didn't make you for that. I made you to live in heaven with me. And that's why I came down to forgive your sin, that whoever believes in him should not perish. And so instead of living apart from God in a place of punishment, he says, no, what I have planned for you is that you will have everlasting life. And of course, uh, where do we have that everlasting life? We have it in heaven. That's right. God says, I made you to live in heaven with me. You're going to be the bride of Christ someday. And you also are going to rule and reign with him. He has wonderful plans for you. Oh, it is such a wonderful verse. Now, I have a question for you after we have learned this. And that is, can you believe in God without believing in Jesus? You know, there's some people who say, oh, I believe in God. Oh, no, 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 I don't believe in Jesus, but I believe in God. Can you? You know, the answer is, no, you can't. Because if you believe in the Bible, then you must believe in Jesus. Because the God of the Bible says, I have a son. His name is Jesus. He came down to die for your sin. So you can't say, oh, God, I believe you. And he says, well, I have a son. His name is Jesus. Oh, I don't believe that. If you say that, you don't believe in God. And you know, kids, I want to ask you another question. You know, some people will say, Hmm, there are many ways that you can get to God. Oh, oh yes, Jesus. Jesus is just one way. Now, is that true? You remember that in the garden, Jesus was praying, and he says, Lord, if it be possible, let this pass from me. And he was talking about dying on the cross and being separated from God. What did God say? God says, no, it's not possible. There is no other way. This is the only way that they can have their sins forgiven and that they then will not perish, but have everlasting life.
And you know, kids, if there were many other ways, or even one other way to get to heaven, then why would God have his son die a very painful death on the cross? Just to say, oh, you know, we're just making another way. Oh, there's many ways. Let's just throw this in and, and we can have another way. There is no other way. Instead of apologizing and saying, well, you know, there, there, there is only one way. We need to say, you know, if Jesus had not died on that cross in our place, there would be no other, be no way at all. If Jesus had not died on that cross in our place, there would be no way. He provided a glorious way for us at a great cost to him. But we just need to believe. We need to turn from our sin, put our faith and trust in him. And the Bible says you will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is so wonderful. This is a fabulous verse. We have motions to it too. And it goes, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And of course, we're pointing to the nail prints because his only begotten son is Jesus. That whoever believes, I, I know it, but I believe it. So whoever believes, I know it, but it's solid. Whoever believes in him should not perish. Now, you know, one hand's up, one hand's down. Should not perish. You know, when we die, we go into the grave, but we really start to live. So, should not perish, but have everlasting, lasts forever, everlasting. And then you can put your hands in the shape of an L, everlasting life. And you can kind of wiggle your fingers with that L too, everlasting life. And that's John 3, 16. So let's just do it one time from the top. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, isn't that wonderful? I want you to say it and sing it now. You did a great job. Do it one more time. I love that verse, don't you? Do it again for me. That was great. You did a fabulous job. Now remember, we are having stories about Elisha, and Elisha lived in the land of Israel. But our story today takes place up here in Syria. Here's Israel down here. Here's Syria up here. And the Bible tells us that it is about a man named Naaman. Now Naaman 
was commander of the army of the Syrians. He was the one that was in charge. You know, gets next to the king. The commander of the army was the most powerful person in the land. And it tells us that even though he did not know God, he was a great man. He was a man that, that was mighty. People knew him, but he was also great in his character. The Bible says that he was honorable. He did things that were honest. He was kind. He was thoughtful. And, and the king loved him. You know, many times kings are jealous of the commander of the army because they command the entire army. And they can go against the king at any time. But the Bible says that because he was so honorable and great, he was great in the eyes of the king. The king also loved him very much. But then the Bible tells us something that even the people in Israel did not know. And he did not know. And also the king did not know. You see, Syria up here had been raiding Israel. They would write into Israel, and they'd say, oh, we want this, and we want that, and we want to take this person, and we want to take that person. And they would capture people and capture goods. And Israel would fight back, but Israel was not strong enough to win against them. But the Bible says here that the reason Naaman won was because the Lord was giving him victory. Now, why would the Lord give a country that didn't believe in him victory over his country? It was because the people in his country had turned to idols. They weren't following him anymore. Oh, yes, Elisha was, but just a few people were, not many. And so God says, I'm not going to protect you. Do you know that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you, though, go out and you do things that are foolish, maybe you drive too fast, or maybe you take drugs and you do things, God says, I'm not going to protect you. It can be very serious consequences. We need to be following the Lord. And the people in Israel were not following the Lord. And he was also a mighty man of valor. Do you know, a mighty man of valor is someone who's brave in the face of danger, especially when he would go out to battle. He didn't say, oh, you guys go fight all, stay back here. No, he was right out there in the front. But the Bible says that even though he had all these wonderful things, and I'm sure he had money and power and respect and fame, there was one thing he had that made all of this worth nothing. Do you know that you can have good grades? You can be good at sports. You can be very popular. But there's one thing that you can have that can make all of that totally useless in your life. And so you can't even enjoy that at all. And that was the same as Naaman. Now what Naaman had was he had a disease called leprosy. And leprosy was a terrible disease, and, and it would make your nerve endings that you couldn't feel anything. So if you cut yourself, you didn't know, and then you would get infected, and sometimes then your fingers would have to be amputated, and the same things with your feet. And, and then you would become disfigured, and, and, and sometimes your hands would become claw-like. And there was no cure for leprosy. But you know, God says that leprosy is ugly, and awful, and it makes you deformed. But God says that when I look at people, I look into their hearts, and he says, I see something that looks just as bad as leprosy. Because the Bible says that leprosy is like sin. You know, you may see these people on TV and, oh, they're just so beautiful. But if you could see inside of them, you would see that there is corruption and deceit and, and they're, they're not kind. And God says, when I see inside their hearts, I see something that looks to me just as awful and terrible as the terrible disease of leprosy. And you know, God says that our sin is like leprosy, and God has one way that our sin can be cleansed. 
We're not healed from our sin. We're cleansed, and we're cleansed by washing. And what washes our sin away? Oh, it's not soap and water. No. There's only one thing that will wash our sin away, and God says it's the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, with leprosy, they would talk about leprosy. Not that you could heal leprosy. It was always that you need to be cleansed of your leprosy because God said it is like sin. But, you know, we know there's a cure for sin, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood. But, you know, there was no cure for leprosy. Naaman had this leprosy, and there was no cure. Nothing that he could do about it. Now, the Bible tells us that there was a little girl, and she was out playing one day. And these soldiers came from Syria, and they grabbed her, and they said, you know what, she'll make a good slave. And they took her away and carried her back on their horses, and she never saw her parents again. Now, you know, kids, we had just learned the verse, so you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? We learned that, didn't we? What about her? Did she have something to fear? Was God her helper? You know what? The Bible says that God was in all of this. I don't know what her parents thought. I certainly hope her parents did not say, oh, I'm never going to believe in God again. They took my little girl. Look what God did to me. God had a plan and a purpose. On this earth, things are not going to be easy for you. Things are going to be hard. There may be some very hard things that happen. But God says, I am in it, and I have a plan. Remember, we also learned, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. This little girl found herself as a servant. And that little girl became a servant. And she became a servant to Mrs. Naaman. Now, it was Mrs. Naaman's husband, the general, who was in charge of going and capturing and taking away these slaves. But you know, she found out as she worked there. Now, she made a choice. She was there as a slave and a servant. She was not in a place where anybody else loved the Lord. Every day she had to work and do whatever this woman wanted her to. She had no free time. But kids, wherever you are, you have a choice. Am I going to learn to obey those who rule over me? Am I going to accept this as being from God? Or am I going to be angry and bitter and resentful? This little girl, oh, she made the right choice. She says, you know, God has put me here. I am going to obey, and I'm going to be happy about it. Well, she wasn't there very long before she found out that her master had leprosy. Now, she, this little girl, was a lot like you. She knew the stories of Elisha. I'm sure when she was in her home, she'd say, Mommy, tell me again. Tell me how, how he raised that little boy from the dead. And tell me how Elijah did, too. And tell me how God sent down the fire from heaven and the oil that the, the widow mother had to pay the debt so her sons wouldn't have to be slaves. Tell me that story again. Oh, she knew, and she believed. She believed in God. And so when she found out that her master had leprosy, why, she just believed that God was the one that could help them. You know what, kids? God is the one that can help you with all your problems and anyone in your household. And if there is someone that has a problem, you can be the one to tell them, God is our helper. And so she... She could have thought, you know, I'm too young. People aren't going to listen to me. I'm from a foreign country. But she says, I don't care. He has a problem. I know the answer. I'm going to tell him. So she said to her mistress, she says, oh, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Well, he would heal him of his leprosy. What? I'm sure Mrs. Naaman thought, there is no cure for leprosy. Don't you know that? But the little girl, she spoke with such conviction. She just knew it to be true. And so when her husband came home, I'm sure Mrs. Naaman says, you know, you know, dear, I can't hardly believe it myself, but our little servant girl, 
she said that there is a cure, that there is a prophet in Israel, and he could cure you of the leprosy. Now, kids, he was general of the army. Was he going to take the word of a little girl? He did. And you know, he not only took her word, but the Bible tells us that he went to the king of his country. So Naaman went to the king, and he told the king, this little girl, she says, there's someone in Samaria that could cure my leprosy. And I'm sure the king of Syria said, what? They have a god that's stronger than ours. Well, we've prayed to all the gods here, and our gods can't cure you. And, and their god, what well, our god, is allowing us victory. What he didn't know was it was their god that was allowing them victory. But Naaman says, you know what? I should try. There is no hope any other place. Maybe I should just go. She sounds so sure of herself. And so the king says, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will send this letter with you. And I will write here, let's see, yes. Mm, dear king of Israel, please cure my servant Naaman of his leprosy. Here, Naaman, take this and go. And so Naaman, he did. But he just didn't go. He loaded up chariots of clothing and silver and gold. And he says, I'm going to take a lot of reward with me. Now, Syria had won over Israel every time they would invade them. But he still says, I'm going to take something. And so he goes to the king of Israel. Oh, oh. We are transforming this into the palace of the king of Israel. All right, so he arrives in Samaria. Now, kids, the king of Israel, he knew about God. In fact, they had just had a major conflict with another country. And he had called for Elisha, and Elisha helped him out. And with God's help, he had won. And so when Naaman came to him, don't you think he'd be prepared? You know, the Bible says that Naaman came to the king, and the king, he got all upset. And he forgot about God. Maybe you've heard about God. And then every time a trial or something hard happens, you just go into hysterics and you get all fearful and you have no idea where to turn. You forget that you know a God who can help you and deliver you. That was this king. And so when he read the note from the king of Syria, oh, it said, cure my servant Naaman. And he said, cure him of leprosy? Well, it would be like me taking a dead person and making him alive. I can't do that. And then he says, you know what? He's just picking a fight. He just wants to pick a fight with me. That's all. That's why he sent this to me. And then in those days when they were really distressed, they would just tear their clothes. Well, I'm sure Naaman was, it was like, I, I, I came here. And, and, and the little girl, she sounded so sure. And now you're telling me? that you can't do anything? And I'm sure that he was embarrassed. I'm sure that he thought, what a wasted trip. It had taken him a long time to come from Syria down. And I'm sure that he was very discouraged. He had had hope, and now he had no hope. But the king lived in Samaria, and so did Elisha. And when the captain came with all his chariots, I'm sure it made a big stir. And word got to Elisha that the king had torn his clothes because of his distress over not being able to cure Naaman of his leprosy. So Elisha sent a messenger to the king and said, send him to me. <laughs> there, there's a prophet in Israel, king. You know that. God is speaking to us now. Send him to me. God is powerful. He can help him. And so the king was so relieved. He says, yes, go, go, go to Elisha. He will help you, go. And so Naaman, with hope again, got into his chariot 
with his man and went to Elisha's house. So Naaman went with his horses and his chariot to the house of Elisha. And the Bible tells us that Elisha sent out his servant Gehazi. Now, kids, you know what? Elisha was a humble man. If somebody important came to visit me, I would want to go out and see them. But Elisha says, no, no. He, he let the Lord lead him. He was very humble. And so the servant came out and said to Naaman, he says, Naaman, I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. This is a message from Elisha, and Elisha got it from the Lord. You are to go and wash in the Jordan River seven times. And if you do that, your flesh will be totally restored. Go wash in the Jordan. That was it. Do you think that Naaman would be so excited? Why, that was so simple. Just go down to the Jordan River, dip seven times, and his flesh would be restored. Such a simple thing to do. Do you know what the Bible says his reaction was? It says, but Naaman became furious, <gasps> filled with anger. Oh, he was so mad. And he went in, away, and he says, you know what? <laughs> Surely I thought that he would come out and he would stand and call on the name of his Lord. And he would wave his hands over the place and heal my leprosy. That's what I thought he was going to do. Now, you know, kids, it's like when people come to the Lord Jesus Christ to have their sins forgiven. Some people say, well, I just think that it should be this way. No, you know what? I just think that if we do a lot of good works, that definitely God will accept us into heaven. God says it's by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who paid the price. Your good works will never be good enough. And you know, a lot of people, they will not come to the Lord Jesus on the terms that God has put down. And that was Naaman. He says, it's too easy. No, I, I can't do it. And the Bible even says that he went away in a rage. That's how upset he was. So as Naaman was going away in a rage, because he says, you know what? We have got better rivers in Syria. The Jordan River is a dirty river. Why would he send me to a dirty river in the Jordan? Could I not wash in my own country and be clean? And so he turned and he went away in a rage. But you know what? The Bible says that his servants, as they were on their way home, they came to him. And you know, kids, he was a man that was loved by his servants. And so they said, my father, it was a very endearing term. They said, no, no, now Naaman, my father, if the prophet had asked you to do something great, would you have done it? And Naaman thought, well, yes, 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 I, yes, I would have. And they said, but how much more than when he says to you, just wash and be clean. It's so simple. Won't you at least try it? And so Naaman said, okay. So the Bible says that he went down to the Jordan River. Now, kids, in order to dip in the Jordan River, he had to uncover and take off his, his top. And, you know, that just showed the ugliness of his leprosy. Do you know when we have sin, we try and hide it. We don't let people know what we really think about and what we really do when we're in private. We don't want people to see those things. We want to show our good side. And I'm sure that Naaman had everything to cover up his leprosy, but he had to take it off. And so he says, all right, I'll go out. So he walked out into the River Jordan. And as he walked out into the River Jordan, the Bible tells us that he dipped down. He dipped down once, but it wasn't any better. He dipped down twice, no improvement. He dipped down the third time, mm -mm, no change. He dipped down the fourth time, still just as ugly. He went down the fifth time and it, it, it wasn't seemed to be working. He went down the sixth time and, and there wasn't even a slight improvement. 
But how many times had the prophet said, you are to dip down? Seven. And so he says, I'm going to obey. You know, kids, when God tells you to do something, obey. He has wonderful things for you when you obey. But if you don't obey, you're never going to know. And so then he dipped down the seventh time. And when he came up, ah! His skin was like that of a little child. He was completely healed. It was perfect. I'm sure there were tears running down his eyes and running down the eyes of his men. And when he came up, he was no longer a proud man. Oh, he was humble. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you have done for me. And so he got out of that water, a healed man. And what do you think he did then? Do you think he went back to Syria? No, he didn't. He turned his chariot right around, and he went right back to see Elisha. So when he went back, the Bible tells us this time, Elisha came out. Elisha came out to talk to him. And he says, oh, thank you so much. You know, kids, Elisha didn't come out before because he didn't want Naaman to think that he had anything to do with it, that it was all of God. And so Naaman says, oh, thank you so much. The God of Israel is the only one true and living God. I only believe in him now. And he says, I have, I, I have all these presents for you. I have gold and silver and beautiful clothes. Please, please take them. But you know, kids, this was a picture of salvation. This was a picture of when God cleanses us from our sin and makes us totally new inside. And so salvation is free. And so Elisha says, no, I'm not going to take anything. No, I'm not taking one thing. Well, here was Naaman, a very rich man, and he saw the house that Elisha lived in. He saw that he had nothing. Do you think that his respect for Elisha grew when Elisha would not take one cent from him. Oh, he just couldn't believe what a holy, righteous, wonderful man Elisha was. But then he said to Elisha, Elisha, you won't take what I have to give you, but could I have something, something that you have that I would like? And Elisha said, sure, what is it? And he says, I want to take two loads of dirt back and build an altar. I'm not going to worship the gods of Syria anymore. They're not gods that can do anything. From now on, I'm only going to worship the one true and living God. You know what, kids? Naaman received healing, cleansing from his leprosy. But most important, he put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he received cleansing on the outside. You know, if Naaman had died in his leprosy, so, but if he had died with his sins not forgiven, that would have been very serious. Oh, we're so thankful that Naaman obeyed and followed the Lord. I hope you always obey and follow the Lord. Now, there are some people in our story today that you might identify with. What about the king? Maybe you're like the king. You know, the king, he knew about God, but he didn't put his faith and trust in him. It was like, I just want God when I'm in trouble. And he didn't give him any time, any attention. He didn't think about him. And so any time that something would happen, he would just get all excited and upset and, and, and just go hysterical. Because even though he knew about the Lord, he did not give the Lord a place in his life. He wanted to run his own life. He wanted to do things that were only fun and entertaining. He didn't want to spend his time with God. No, no, you know, that was just too much trouble. Maybe you're like the little girl. Maybe you live in a house that's kind of hostile. Maybe you're the only one that knows about the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you think you're a nobody. Maybe you're young. Maybe you think you're unimportant. But you know what? She was the only one that could have told Naaman how he could be cleansed. 
you may be the only one that can tell the people where you live how their sins can be forgiven and how they can be made clean in their heart through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. She could have thought, no one will listen to me. But no, she says, I'm going to tell them what I know. Just tell people what you know. Tell them about the Lord. They need to know about the Lord Jesus and that their sins can be forgiven so they will not perish. Well, maybe you are like Naaman. You know that if I could really look inside of you, I would not see this cute little person sitting there. No, you know what I would see? I would see a heart full of sin and deceit. You lie to your parents. You don't like to obey. You're always throwing temper tantrums. You know what? You're, you're not really honest. You're just out for what I can get. But you know what? The Bible says that you can put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he will cleanse you, that you do not have to die in your sins. They can be cleansed. Put your faith in Jesus. He says, I will make you clean inside. I will wash your sins away. Nothing else will forgive your sins. Nothing else will make you brand new inside and make you totally clean except the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Don't be like Naaman almost was. Oh, he knew, but he almost didn't do it. He almost missed the wonderful cleansing of the Lord. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just tell him, oh, yes, Lord, you are king of the universe. You died on that cross for my sins. Come and live inside of me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And you say, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I hope you've put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and are cleansed inside. It's a wonderful story. God says, I have a wonderful plan for your life. I want you to live your life down here and bring glory to me. And then someday you can go and live in heaven. And all oh, that will be so wonderful. I hope you enjoyed the story today. Wasn't it wonderful what God did for Naaman and what God can do for you? It's a perfect picture of salvation. Well, I have to go now, but I will see you next week. Bye. I love you. God loves you too. Bye.